Yeah, we back. We back. Now today, man, we're going to be talking about the warfare of ancient West Africa. Now, as you can see, I titled the video, Did Africans, quote unquote, sell their own people into slavery? Now, I got a whole playlist in my playlist section where I debunked that entire talking point. And this is going to be added to the collection. But similar to how we study the ancient warfare of Europe going back for the past thousand years, the wars between the French and the British, the Austrians, the Prussians, the Swedes and the Russians, the French and the, and the Spanish, the Spanish and the Portuguese, the Portuguese and the British. For whatever reason, we can study the wars, the ancient tribal wars that happened in Europe over the past thousand years. And nobody ever says that the Europeans did it to their own people. You know, for whatever reason, man, when we talk about the ancient warfare on the continent of Africa, everybody gets thrown in the same boat. They just say, oh, the Africans, you know, the Africans, this mysterious, vague term that covers the whole continent, the Africans. You see, the European, he gets his individual respect. Oh, that's the Russian man. Oh, that's the Polish man. Oh, that's the British man. That's the French man. That's the Spanish man. You know what I mean? But when it comes to the African, he don't get that same respect. You know, oh, nah, that's the Mandinka man. Oh, that's the that's the Yoruba man. No, oh, that, that's the fawn man. Oh, that's the that's the Ashanti man. No, oh, that, that's the African. That's the Africans. It's it's one vague term. So when we discuss ancient African history, it gets thrown in one box. Oh, the Africans did this to their own people, but you never hear the Asians did this to their own people. Whenever we discuss the ancient wars that happened between the Japanese and the Chinese, you know they get the individual respect when they refer to their individual nations, but we never give that same respect to the ancient nations on the African continent. So today, man, we're gonna discuss some ancient rivalries that specifically occurred on the west coast of Africa. You know, the same way we study the ancient warfare between the French and the British and the Americans and the British and the Spanish and the Portuguese, we are going to discuss the military history and the military rivalries that occurred on the west coast of Africa. Now, keep in mind, some of the modern nations on the African continent share the same names with some of the ancient kingdoms, but that doesn't mean that it's the exact same nation we're talking about. For example, the ancient empire of Ghana was not located in present day Ghana, right? The, the ancient kingdom of Benin was not located in the present day Republic of Benin. It was mainly situated in Nigeria. The ancient kingdom of the Congo was not located in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was mainly situated in Angola. So we got to be sure that we don't get confused when we discuss the ancient history on the African continent. We don't get confused with the modern nations and the ancient nations. But anyways, let's get into it, man. Take a look up on the screen. In the 16th to 17th century, the power of the kings of Bernou, Benin, and Kuradafa was noted by contemporary chroniclers to be unrivaled. They engaged in extensive offensive and defensive wars, seizing many cities and towns and imposing their sovereignty on other groups. Now, this is why I say when we study the history of our ancestors, especially the military history of our forefathers, we have to give it the same respect that we do when we discuss the military history of our enemies. When we discuss the military history of the French and the British and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch and everything like that, we give them their individual histories and their individual distinctions. We don't say, oh, the Europeans did this against their own people because we understand that during that time, those individual nations were battling amongst each other for prestige and power and prosperity and supremacy. We have to we have to tell it like it is, man. We have to tell it like it is, bro. And we can't get so emotional about that, that we don't understand the context of the situation. Now, as you already know, I'm all for the unity of black men. I understand what it is, but I love studying the ancient military history of our forefathers at the same time, though. You know, at, at the same time, I love studying the military history of our forefathers. Now, let's continue. Also, for those of y'all that don't know, those three regions that we just spoke about, they were located in modern day Nigeria and parts of Niger, Chad and Cameroon. When they talk about the kings of Bernou, the kings of Benin and the kings of uh, I don't know how to pronounce the last word, uh, Kuradafa. You know what I mean? I might have pronounced it wrong, but those were the modern day regions that they were discussing. Now, let's continue. Now we're going to discuss some written accounts from European explorers on what they wrote when they observed these ancient West African societies. In 1668, Alfred Dapper wrote, the king of Benin can in a single day make 20,000 men ready for war and if need be 180,000. And because of this, he has great influence among the surrounding peoples. Now, one thing that differs from us, the modern day black man and our forefathers, the ancient black man is our forefathers understood the concept of power, understood the concept of self-interest, understood the concept 
of being willing to die to advance your agenda. So when we examine the historical record and we can see the mistakes they make, we can take some of the good things that they embodied and then use it to our present day situation and throw out some of the toxic things that they engaged in, such as the constant warfare amongst each other. And instead of going to war amongst each other, we combine our forces, our expertise and mobilize against those who really want to do us harm collectively. Uh, and I'm not talking about any type of violence on the YouTube. I'm not talking about violence. I'm no violence. I got to say that for YouTube, but we just examine in history. We just study in history. We're not we're not encouraging violence. We just study in the history of the black man. That's all we doing. That's all we doing. You know, <laughs> that's all we doing. I got to give the disclaimer and let's continue. In 1668, Alfred Dapper wrote at the bottom. The king of Benin's domain extends over many cities, towns and villages as there is no king in the vicinity who is in possession of many beautiful cities and towns or his equal. The king of Benin engages in extensive wars beyond his land against neighboring kings, especially to the east and north of the Benin River. He seizes many towns and cities, acquiring significant loot, including gemstones and other valuable items. In the early years of the 1500s, the king of Benin was always at war with his neighbors, taking numerous captives and in the 1570s, Idris Aluma, the king of Bernou, made several offensive and defensive military campaigns against neighboring and outlying groups. Now, when you examine the history on the African continent, what you see happening here is no different than what happened in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, etc. Different groups of men battling for supremacy and dominance in their region they didn't look at each other as their own people right the king of benin didn't look at the neighboring kings as his own people nah that, those are the enemies next door you know those are the enemies to the east those are the enemies over there we gotta vanquish them we gotta we gotta we gotta take everything them niggas got that was the mentality we gotta take everything they got you know what i'm saying so we could take everything back to our people that was the mentality man you know it was that it was that warrior mentality but it was directed against you know your neighbors because they wasn't going out to the sea and going into foreign territory so it was really about expanding your territory your landmass your power your influence your reach your dominance in your region your locality wherever you was at that's what it was about that's what it was about before the europeans went to sea to conquer the new world as they say they spent centuries upon centuries upon centuries battling amongst themselves same thing happened in asia centuries upon centuries battling amongst themselves that's how it is man that's how that's how this shit go man that's how this shit go but when we study our history, we have to take the good with the bad. We have to look at our mistakes that we made, examine our strengths, our weaknesses, take the good element that our ancestors embodied, apply it to our current predicament, and then move forward, man. Move forward in unity, you know, move forward. Understand our current situation is different than what it was back then. And due to the mistakes we made back then is why we are in the current situation right now. You know, that's why you got to study history. And let's continue. Now, let's jump into the Mali Empire. You know what I mean? You already know, one of the most famous of all time. Take a look up on the screen. The wealth of Mali during Mansa Musa's rule came from the insignificant tributes of gold paid by tributary states nominally under Mali's rule to the south and from taxes paid by foreigners and local traders. According to Al Dukali, who spent 35 years in the capital, the kings of Mali learned from experience that whenever they had imposed direct rule over the so-called pagan people of the gold fields, the production of gold decreased considerably. They therefore preferred to leave the gold fields in the hands of the inhabitants and were satisfied with tribute extracted from them. This remote control over the gold fields was enough for the kings of Mali to accumulate vast quantities of gold, some of which was so lavishly distributed in Cairo by Mansa Musa. Now, like I said, man, our ancestors, it was it was about business, man. It was about power. You know, like I always say, it was it, it was about power, man. It was about power, prestige, dominance, wealth, glory, victory. And that's what it was about, man. That's what it was about. It wasn't about no Disney Channel storyline about we off. We are family. I got all my brothers with me. Bro, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was, nigga, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to the money. I'm trying to get to the power. I'm trying to get to it, bro. You know, I got to make my nation victorious and glorious. That's what it was about. That's what it was about. You know, we can look at their mistakes now and understand the, the necessity for unity in the modern context. But back then it was different, you know. The, the landscape was different. Let's continue. Now we're gonna discuss the downfall of the Mali Empire. While the coastal threat had been abated, an even more dangerous problem had arrived on the empire's northern and eastern frontier in the form of an imperial Songhai state under the leadership of Sunni Ali. In 1465, Songhai forces under Suleiman Dama attacked the province of Mima, 
which has seceded from Mali in the first few decades of the 15th century. The Songhai Empire also captured Timbuktu in 1468, which had already fallen out of the Mali Empire's hands. The Songhai also took Jenna out of Mali's sphere of influence in 1473. By then, the message that the Songhai was sending Mali was clear indeed. If the Mansa could not hold on to his provinces, Songhai would. So essentially what happened was, as Mali began to fall off, the Songhai was like, listen, I'm the new king on the block. I'm the new boss on the block. This my block. This my shit now. You know what I'm saying? I got them old heads up out of there. It's my shit now. I'm the new young blood on the block. So Songhai began to rise to power as Mali began to fall off. Let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. Songhai was the largest African state in history and the direct successor to the Mali Empire's wealth, territory, prestige, and glory. Songhai had existed as a small independent kingdom in Gao since the 11th century. In the 13th century, Gao was conquered by Mali and incorporated into the Mali Empire. Later in the 14th century, as Mali's power and influence began to decline, Songhai regained control of Gao from the Mali Empire. So you see how over the course of centuries, it was this back and forth of battling for power and supremacy originally Songhai had access and dominance in certain areas Mali came through swallowed everybody up took the whole shit over Mali fell off now Songhai the king on the block now let's continue by the mid 15th century the Mali empire was in a free fall and Songhai took advantage of the chaos to expand his territory Songhai captured most of the territory in Mali including the cities of Jenna and Timbuktu under Sunni Ali Songhai surpassed Mali in wealth power and prestige now we about to talk about one of my personal favorites you know what i mean one of the most notorious rivalries in african history the daomey versus the oyo let's start with daomey in the early 18th century before king agaja invaded the powerful kingdom of wida he offered his daughter in marriage to the king of wida as a sign of peace one night his daughter poured water into all of wida's barrels of gunpowder while they slept daomey invaded the following morning Man, that's one of my favorite stories right there, man. That's one of my favorite stories right there, man. Let's continue. The wars with the powerful Oyo Empire to the east of Daomey resulted in Agaja accepting tributary status to that empire and providing yearly gifts. After this, Agaja attempted to control the new territory of the kingdom of Daomey through military suppressing revolts and creating administrative and ceremonial systems. Agaja died in 1740 after another war with the Oyo. Now, let's get into it. Let's get into it. We're going to discuss... The Oyo, you know what I'm saying? We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the glorious and the uh, the prestigious empire of the Oyo. Let's get into it. Not wasting no time. Take a look up on the screen. The Oyo Empire was the Yoruba Empire in West Africa. It was located in present-day southern Benin in western Nigeria. The empire grew to become the largest Yoruba-speaking state through the organizational and administrative efforts of the Yoruba people, trade as well as the military use of cavalry. The Oyo Empire was one of the most politically important states in Western Africa from the mid-17th century to the late 18th century and held sway not only over most of the other kingdoms in Yoruba land, but also nearby African states, notably the Fawn Kingdom of Dahomey in the modern Republic of Benin on its west. It was not a game when it came to the Oyo. I'm going to tell you right now. It was not a game when the Oyo generals was pulling up. Nigga, it was not a game. <laughs> it was not a game. You know what I'm saying? Man down, man down. Let's continue. There was a high degree of professionalism in the army of the Oyo Empire. Its military success was due in large part to its cavalry as well as the leadership and courage of Oyo officers and warriors. Because its main geographic focus was north of the forest, the Oyo enjoyed easier farming and thus a steady growth in population. This contributed to Oyo's ability to consistently field a large force. There was also an entrenched military culture in Oyo where victory was obligatory and defeat carried the duty of committing suicide. This do or die policy contributed to the military aggressiveness of the Oyo generals. Like I told you brothers, it was not a game when the Oyo was pulling up. It was not a game. Man down, man down. When them Oyo generals pulling up on horseback, nigga, it was not a game. <laughs> Let's continue. In 1823, Daome was reported to have raided villages that were under the protection of Oyo. Oyo immediately demanded a huge tribute from King Gezo for the unauthorized incursion to which Gezo dispatched the Brazilian viceroy, Francisco Felix de Souza, to the Alafin of Oyo to make peace. The peace talks eventually broke down and Oyo subsequently attacked Daomey. The Oyo army was decisively defeated 
ending Oyo's hegemony over Daomei. After gaining its independence, Daomei began raiding the corridor. Like I said, man, when you remove the rose colored sunglasses from your eyes and you look at the situation for what it was and you don't get so emotional about it, you understand that our forefathers was some real G's. You know what I'm saying? There was some real dudes, man. They, they was not fucking around. You know, they was not fucking around. They was not fucking around. And in fact, we need to make more movies about the ancient military exploits and adventures of our forefathers, man. The same way we got a thousand movies of the European warfare and European battles and American, you know, ancient civil war battles and all this stupid shit. We need way more movies that depict accurately the ancient history, especially the military history of our ancestors, man. We got to we got to put this shit on the big screen. Let's continue. The Oyo Empire began to decline due to Fulani jihads and slave raids. Daomei saw an opportunity to reassert itself as a dominant power. King Gezo of Daomei declared all out war on the Oyo. He tasked the Mino with wreaking havoc on the Yoruba. And the Mino, as we already know, that was the female branch of the Daomei military. Now let's continue. The mighty Gezo of Daomei, one of the most astute rulers in the Bight of Benin region during the pre-colonial era. During Daomei's darkest hour, he seized the throne and gave his people independence from the neighboring Oyo Empire. The Daomei warriors were originally founded to hunt elephants. Eventually, they evolved into the king's personal bodyguard, then to the guardians of the kingdom. The king tasked them with destroying their fiercest and oldest enemy, the Oyo Empire of the Yoruba. To assert Daomei's independence, he refused to pay tributes to the Oyo, crushed an Oyo expeditionary force in the 1820s and decisively attacked the sections of the Mai territory that had long been under the Oyo Empire. And in that section, they're talking about the reign and the military exploits of King Gezo. Now let's continue. Gezo embraced cosmopolitanism to an extent that visitors wrote that there was no pure Dahomeyan. Gezo increased the number of Yoruba Dahomeyans by welcoming thousands of Yoruba refugees that had been displaced as a result of the collapse of the Oyo Empire, integrating them into Dahomey society. Additionally, he trained Dahomey's armed female bodyguards into superior military fighters, deploying them when Dahomey pushed into Oyo regions of Egbado, Anago, and Awori for retribution purposes. The Mina were renowned for decapitating their opponents in the midst of combat with just one swing of the sword, a skill they had developed and refined from hunting and chopping through elephant meat. Listen, man. You heard what they said. They said the black women in Naomi run up on you with, with the sword, chop your head off with one swing of the sword. Nigga. Listen, I, I listen, back in the day, I listen. If I if I was to go back in time, I need me a wife from Naomi. You know, I, I need me one of, yeah, I need me one of the Amino. You feel me? I need me, I need me, yeah. <laughs> I need me one of the Amino. Yeah, I need that. I need that. Let's continue. In 1764, the Mino added to their already legendary status when they confronted and soundly defeated an Ashanti army which had attempted to capture Wida. The Ashanti at this time were the most militaristic and the most powerful nation in West Africa. In 1835, the Oyo attempted one final invasion of Daome, but the Oyo army was soundly defeated. Oyo never regained its prominence and Daome became the top military power in the region. The Dahome Oyo Wars still rank as some of the most devastating wars in Africa's history. Listen, man, the same way we study World War II and World War I and all that shit, man, we got to study the history, the military history, the ancient warfare of our predecessors, man. We got to study that shit, man. We got to study that shit, at least to embody the spirit they embodied, not against each other, but our current adversaries in the present day. Now, let's continue. Now, in this piece of literature, they're not really talking about any ancient warfare that occurred between West African states. This is really what happened during the French invasion of Daomey. And I love this uh, passage because it talks about a 16 year old girl that chopped the head of a Frenchman, chopped the head of a Frenchman, clean off his body and then died on the battlefield. You know, a glorious death. Let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. What became known as the Battle of Contonou started before dawn on the 4th of March during a rainy night. A Dahomeyan force of several thousand, including what the French described as a regiment of women, silently approached the French perimeter. Around five in the morning, Amazons opened the attack by leading a charge against a log stockade. Some prized the stakes apart and thrust their musket barrels through to fire on the defenders. In hand-to-hand -hand fighting, some women were impaled on the bayonets. Now, listen, man, the French, the French are such sons of bitches, man. Listen, 
They impaled our women on the bayonets, mom. Listen. They impaled our women on the bayonets, mom. Yo, bro. They impaled our women on the bayonets, bro. Man. They forever gonna be our enemies, man. It was the first time the fawn had ever faced such weapons. The chief gunner in the stockade, apparently a white sergeant, was killed and decapitated by an Amazon aged about 16 years old, who in turn was slain. Listen, man, her last her last accomplishment on this earth was chopping the head of a Frenchman clean off his body with the machete, my boy. Listen, man. Listen, man. Our, our ancestors was different. Our forefathers and our foremothers, man, they was different, man. They was different, bro. They was different. They wasn't fucking around, man. <laughs> they wasn't fucking around, man. But anyways, man, you know, man, I don't got nothing to say, man. I don't got nothing to say. When we study the history of our forefathers, man, our ancestors, our foremothers, understand that in the context of the situation they were living in, there was no unity at the time. But we can look back on their mistakes they made and we can establish unity in the present day. But we have to understand there was no unity at that time. The same way there was no unity in Europe up until 1885 with the Berlin Conference. But before the Berlin Conference, it was every man for himself. The Frenchman, the Dutchman, the, the Spaniard, the Englishman, uh, the Portuguese man. It was every man for himself up until the Berlin Conference of 1885. When they sat down at the table like brothers and, and was talking big business. But before that, it was every man for himself. And the same thing happened on the African continent, on the Asian continent, in the Middle East. Same thing happened all over the world, man. Same thing happened all over the world, man. So we have to understand and and conceptualize and, and compartmentalize the history of our ancestors, man. And stop throwing everything in the same box. Stop saying, oh, the Africans did this to their own people. Because as you can say, as you can see, our predecessors did not look at each other as their own people, which led to their downfall overall, right? Their disunity led to their downfall, but we can look back on their mistakes and understand the mistakes they made and improve upon what they left behind. So anyways, man, it's your boy Nefakari that's Celine back in the building. Yes, indeed. Cash up on the screen and I'm gone. Peace. Reincarnated, I'm back in original fashion. I left on a horse and came back in that ass and I left with abundance and came back to famine. We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping. Look how the mighty have fallen. Used to be running, now we be walking. When you be cooning, that's when they applauded. Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter. Gotta come up in this shit. They stuck in the mix. Really, my heart would be breaking. That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business. Pass it down in generation. Talking about money and power and building a nation. That's a deadly combination. Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genders. Falsifying information. Now they got mad. Intentions. Step in the room and I'm feeling attention. Enemy watching me blocking my vision. Get for the check cause I need my redemption. Building my kingdom, I need it protected. Ready for war like a young money Congo. Never decided the team is the motto. Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles. Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato. I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and making ambition. I'm blessed by the guys, but I ain't religious. I came for the power, they came for the bitch. They making no hourly wage. I got business. This shit is an art and it can never be taught. Selling my soul, I can never be bought. Play with my money, I see you in court. Run to the check and I do it for sport, Babylon falling, I go to the source, packing my luggage and go overseas, shorty be with me and she so at least, shorty be chosen, I'm calling her Hershey, secret intelligence probably gonna murder me, don't fuck with brands cause nigga I'm Haitian, say the wrong shit and you're smacking their faces.